Hello and welcome to the third lecture in the course Introduction to Game Programming 1DV437, summer course at Linnaeus University, and my name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck. Today we're going to talk about math, geometry and collisions, and if you have studied linear algebra before, you will probably recognize a lot of things we will talk about today. So, the first thing we come in contact with when we talk about math in 3D games is the vector. And a game development, when we develop games, requires that we use a lot of numerical quantities. It's a lot of numbers, basically. And some can be described by using single numerical values, distance, time, mass, speed, etc. And these are what we call scalars. A scalar is a single numerical value. But there are other quantities that cannot be described with a single value. The difference between two points in space is represented by both the distance and the direction pointing from one of the points to the other. So we have two values. The velocity of a moving object is represented both by its speed and the direction in which it's traveling. So two values again. And the force is represented by its magnitude, the strength of the force, and the direction in which it is applied. And quantities with both a magnitude and a direction are what we call vectors. So a vector can have multiple values. Uh, and they are used extensively in game development, uh, particularly in graphics, 3D graphics, and 2D graphics, uh, audio development, uh, physics simulation, artificial intelligence, etc. And it's important for us game developers to have a good knowledge about the math behind vectors. Uh, so before we would go into and learn about graphics, in the next lecture we need to learn something about vectors and arithmetic. We can visualize a vector by drawing a line segment and an arrowhead in one end of a line. And the length of a line segment corresponds to the magnitude of a vector, the strength of the force, or whatever the vector is representing. And the angle at which it's drawn corresponds to the direction of the vector. And multiplying a vector by a scalar changes the length of a line segment by the factor of a scalar. Thus, we are modifying its magnitude. In text, a vector is often denoted by bold capital text. So a V vector is represented as a bold V. So here are some examples of a vector. We have a single vector V uh, to the left, and in the middle we have multiplied V by the scalar 2, so it's twice the size, and on the right we have multiplied it by minus 1 which changes the direction of a vector, but leaves the magnitude unchanged. We can also add two vectors. Uh, the sum of two vectors are formed by placing the beginning of the second vector w at the end of the first vector b, and then form a new vector from the beginning of v to the end of w. So we have two vectors to the left, v and w, and we put W directly after V, and then we draw a new, the blue vector from the start of V to the end of W, and we have the addition of V and W. Subtraction is quite similar, the difference V minus W are formed in the same way, except that the direction of W is reversed. So we put the w vector at the end of a v vector, but we reverse its direction. So it's going downwards instead of upwards in this case. And the new vector formed from the beginning of v and the end of w is the v minus w vector. A scalar is represented by a single value, speed for example. Uh, a vector is represented by multiple numerical values, which we call components. And the number of components, n, corresponds to the dimension of a vector. So a two-dimensional vector has two components, three-dimensional, three components, and so on. And we write a vector, an n-dimensional vector, as an ordered n-tuple. So the vector v in bold equals angle bracket, 
and the components v1, v2, v3 and so on up to the number n, the dimension of the vector. So a three-dimensional vector v with a component 1, 2 and 3 is written as bold v equals angle bracket 1, 2, 3. And the components are referred to as, as the x, y and z components of a vector, so we can write them as vx equals 1, vy equals 2, v z equals 3. So now we have a vector representing a three-dimensional space. Uh, and note that when we write the different components, we don't use a bold v, since it represents a scalar value and not a vector. We can also add and subtract the vectors uh, mathematically without representing it graphically. And it's done by adding or subtracting the components of each vector. So if we multiply v and w, we sim or s add v and w, we simply add the different components to each other. And when we have subtraction, v minus w, we simply subtract the v components by the w components. The magnitude or length of a many dimensional vector is written as uh, two vertical lines and a v. And it's defined as the square root of the sum of the different co components squared. So for a three dimensional vector, v, this becomes the square root of vx power to, two, to the power of 2 plus vy power of 2 and so on. Uh, the simple and well-known Pythagoras theorem. The distance between two points p and q is equal to the magnitude of the vector p minus q. So if we, want, we have two points in three-dimensional space or any n-dimensional space, we can calculate the distance by calculating the magnitude of the vector going between the two points. Multiplying a vector by scalar a changes the magnitude of a vector by a factor a, which we showed graphically before. And mathematically, this is done by multiplying each component with a scalar. So a times the vector v equals a times v1, a times v2, and so on, until we have reached the dimension of the vector. We often also talk about normalized vectors, and a vector with a magnitude of 1 is said to be normalized or sometimes to have unit length. It's the same thing. Uh, and note that this is not the same as a normal vector, which we will discuss pretty soon. Uh, and any vector v can be normalized by dividing it by its magnitude. So v hat equals the vector v divided by the magnitude of vector v. And the hat sign is a common notation to indicate that a vector has unit length. So if you see a vector with a hat sign, you know that the vector has unit length. And the unit vectors for the coordinate axis, which we are pretty familiar with when we develop games, we can call them i, j, and k, uh, are often used for unit vectors aligned to the free coordinate axis. So i is the unit vector for the x axis, j for the y axis, and k for the z axis. And it's unit length because we only have one and zeros. The other numerical quantity we need to be familiar with is matrix or matrices. And the matrix is a rectangular array of numerical quantities arranged as a set of rows and columns. So a vector consists of a row of scalar values. A matrix consists of rows and columns of scalar values. And they are heavily used in animation and graphics, so we need to know how to work with them. Because we will get in contact with them a lot of times when we develop games. And a matrix with n rows and m columns is called an n times 
M matrix. So the example 2 times 3 matrix M, we also use bold text for matrices, can for example look like M has two rows, the first row with and three columns, so the first row is 1, 2, 3, the second row 4, 5, 6, a simple matrix. And if N equals M, the matrix is called a square matrix, so we have the same number of rows as columns. The individual components of a matrix are called entries. And the entry in row I and column J in matrix M is denoted by MIJ. Note that here we don't use bold text since we represent the scalar value and not the matrix or vector. So the entries for our example M are M11, first row, first column equals 1, M12, first row, second column equals 2, and so on. So we have six components in the 2 times 3 matrix. And the entries M, I, I are called the main diagonal entries of M. So the diagonal 9, 11, 4, 10, the diagonal of a matrix are called the diagonal entries. And the square with non-zero entries only of a main diagonal is called a diagonal matrix. So except for a diagonal we only have zeros in the matrix. There's also something called the transpose of a matrix M, denoted by M, T, is obtained by exchanging the rows and columns. So we're reflecting the entries through the main diagonal. So we take the first row, 1, 2, 3, and put it at the first column in the transpose. We take the second row of the matrix M and put it as the, first, the second column in the transpose. And a matrix that is equal to its transpose is called a symmetric matrix, where every diagonal, every diagonal matrix is symmetric. And the diagonal matrix is where we have zeros except for the main diagonal. Multiplying a matrix with scalar A is done in the same way as we multiplied vector with a scalar A. We multiply all entries by A. So all entries here are multiplied by the same scalar value A. So AM equals MA and we multiply all the entries by A. An n-dimensional vector V can be considered as an n times 1 matrix. Uh, so we have a vector with V1, V2 up to Vn equals a vector with the same. So we take the components of the v-vector and put it as entries in the matrix. And this is what we call a column vector. We can also express a vector as a row matrix, which in fact is the transpose of a column vector, because we take the row and put it as column and vice versa. And then we have a representation that looks very similar to a vector. We can also multiply two vectors together, or two matrices together. Two matrices A and B can be multiplied together if the number of columns in A is equal to the number of rows in B. If it's not, we cannot multiply them together. So it's a requirement to multiply two matrices together. And the entries in the new matrix AB is calculated as the sum of A, I, K times B, K, J. Uh, so it's easiest to show as an example. So we have two matrices, 2, 3, 1, minus 1, multiplied by second matrix, minus 2, 1, 4, minus 5, and equals a new matrix with the values 8, minus 13, minus 6, and 6. So if we look at the second matrix multiplication, we see how it's done. So, first, so the first entry in the result equals the component, the entries in the first row of the first matrix multiplied by the fir first column in the second matrix. And the second value, the blue one, equals the entries in the first row of the first matrix multiplied by the second row in the second matrix. And similar with 
the third value in the, in the result, minus 6, the yellow one is, multiply, is the result of multiplying and adding the second row in the first matrix with the first column in the second matrix. And you see the calculation to the right. So M11 equals 2 times minus 2 plus 3 times 4. So we multiply and add together the different entries in the two matrices to form the resulting matrix. So just remember, multiply the rows of the first column, first matrix with the columns of the second matrix and you are good to go. It turns out that matrix ma ma multiplication is generally not a commutative operation and it means that the product AB is not always the same as the product BA. So we need to be aware of in which order we multiply the different matrices. And it's quite common to say that the product AB is B multiplied by A on the left and BI is then B multiplied by A on the right. So we know in which order we multiply them together. It's quite common that we need to multiply an n times n square matrix with an n dimensional vector. And to do this we can represent the vector as an n times one column matrix, a column vector. So the first matrix M multiplied by the vector V and the resulting is a new n-dimensional vector. So note that uh, it will be a vector with three values. So if we multiply it by a vector with three values, uh, we will get three values, the resulting vector, even if we have a three times three matrix. So we multiply the different entries of the first row in the matrix with the first column in the vector. And the second value is multiplying the second row in the matrix with the column in the vector. And we will get a new n-dimensional vector. The identity matrix, an n times n matrix having entries of 1 along the main diagonal and entries of 0 everywhere else, it's what we call the identity matrix, sometimes denoted as a bold I n. And we have a two-dimensional ma identity matrix and a three-dimensional identity matri matrix. And when a matrix M is multiplied by the identity matrix, the result is M itself. So this is the analog of multiplying a scalar by one. We also have something called the inverse of a vector if we multiply, or inverse of a matrix, sorry. If we multiply a matrix M by another matrix A and the result is the identity matrix, A is called the inverse of M, denoted as M raised to minus 1. Uh, and this is unfortunately quite long and costly operation to calculate the inverse of a matrix and there are graphics libraries that can do that for us. So we simply use the functionality we have in our graphics library, so we won't go into details about how it is done here. There are also some mathematical operations that are very important when it comes to 3D graphics and uh, game development. And the first one we're going to look into is the dot product. The dot product also known as the inner product or scalar product, same name for the same thing, uh, of two vectors is a very important operation in, in game development. And as the name scalar product refers to, the result is a scalar value, so we only get a single value out of the dot product. And the dot product of two n-dimensional vectors v and w denoted as v dot w is calculated as the sum of the different components multiplied by each other. So for a three-dimensional vector the dot product is vx times wx plus vy times wy plus vz times wz. And this is 
a scalar value. So we will get a single value out of the dot product of two vectors, regardless of the dimension of the vectors. And the dot product can also be defined using another important equation. So the dot product v dot w equals the magnitude of v multiplied by the magnitude of w multiplied by cosinus of the angle between the two vectors, the direction of the two vectors. So the angle alpha is the planar angle between the two vectors in which the vectors v and w point. So we can calculate the angle between the two vectors. And if both v and w are normalized, the dot product yields the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And we can show this graphically. So we have two unit vectors v and w, and we have the dot product v times w, and we have the alpha angle, the angle between the two. And this is very important if we need to calculate the angle between two different vectors. And there's a couple of important facts that follow from the dot product equations. Uh, and one is that two vectors v and w are perpendicular. The angle is 90 deg degrees between them, so we have a 90 degree angle alpha, if and only if the dot product v dot w equals zero. And where we where we have vectors where the dot product is zero are what we call orthogonal vectors. And orthogonal vectors are very important in, for example, lighting calculations, which we're going to look into in the next lecture. Another important fact is that the sign of a dot product tells us how close two vectors are to pointing in the same direction. So for any vector v, we can construct a plane that passes through the origin and is perpendicular 90 degrees to the direction of v. And any vector lying on the same side of a plane as v yields a positive dot product. And any vector lying on the opposite side of a pla plane yields a negative dot product with the v vector. And this is important when we check which objects are visible or not in a scene. Yeah. And it can be shown graphically. So we have the plane, the red dotted line, and we have a yellow vector v, and we have some example vectors w. And the w vectors that are on the same side of e have a positive dot product, and the example vectors that are on the opposite side of e have a negative dot product. So it's a very good way of checking whether things are on the opposite side or on the same side as a vector in a plane. The second thing we're going to learn about is the cross product. And the cross product, or sometimes also called the vector product of two vectors v and w, results in a new vector that is perpendicular to both v and w. So the dot product yields a scalar value, but the cross product yields a new vector and the vector is perpendicular. It has the angle 90 degrees to both V and W. And this has many uses in graphics and physics calculations. And the most important one is the calculation of a surface normal vector at a particular point. So normal vectors are very important in graphics. And a normal vector is perpendicular to a plane or two other vectors. The cross product, denoted as v cross w for three dimensional vectors, is defined as uh, a quite long formula. vy multiplied by wz minus vz times wy and so on. So we just need to learn the formula or there are, of course, methods available in most graphics libraries for doing this. And it turns out that the resulting vector is perpendicular perpendicular to the two vectors multiplied together, but two vectors satisfy, uh, two different vectors satisfy these conditions. Because if we have a plane, we can have a perpendicular vector going up and one going down. Uh, and it, but it turns out that the resulting perpendicular vector always follow a pat pattern 
which we call the right-handed rule. So if we put our fingers as shown on the slides and the thumb is the direction of the cross product between the two vectors A and B which is formed by our first two fingers and the thumb is the cross product. Transformations is something we have great use of in game development. Uh, in a game world we have usually have two or more coordinate systems. Uh, we can have a local and a global coordinate system. And the game world has a coordinate system in three axes or two in a 2D world which we call the global coordinate system. So a coordinate system the x, y and z axis for our whole 3D game world. But we put a lot of objects in the game world, geometrical models such as characters, spheres, boxes, etc., light sources and cameras, etc., exist. And when we perform operations on them, for example, rotating or moving an object, uh, it's often easier to use a coordinate system that is aligned to the object instead of the global coordinate system. And this is what we call the local coordinate system. So the coordinate system for each object. And each object in the game world has its own local coordinate system. So we have a game world here. In the center we have a global coordinate axis, the global coordinate system. And we have the two coffee cups. And they have their own aligned local coordinate system, which are not the same as the global coordinate systems. And it turns out that the game engine needs to be able to transform vectors from one coordinate system to another when we render, when we show the game world on the screen. And to do this, we need to use something called a matrix transformation. So we have a vector v in a global coordinate system, and we want to transform v into a vector w in a local coordinate system. And the axis vectors, the x, y, and z vector, axis vectors in the local coordinate system is defined by the vectors r, s, and t in the global coordinate system. So how the local axis vectors are aligned in the global coordinate system. And we, we can then calculate w, the local coordinate the vector b transformed into the local coordinate system by multiplying the different vectors r, s, and t, the axis vector, with the vector v, which is the one we're going to transform. And since r, s, and t are axis vectors, we have a matrix multiplied by a vector, and the result is a new vector. And then we have transformed w into a new coordinate system. And we can also transform in the reverse direction if we multiply w by the inverse of the matrix of the vector with the different axis vectors. But as I said, calculating the inverse of a matrix is a quite complex operation. Uh, but it turns out that in computer graphics we usually have matrices that are orthogonal to each other and in this case the inverse of a matrix matrix is equal to its transpose, which is a much easier calculation because the transpose just take the rows of a column of a matrix and put it as columns in a new matrix. And in this case the reverse transform is calculated as the RVX axis vector dot product the W vector and we get a new vector. So it's a much simpler calculation than if we would not have orthogonal matrices. And the transformation when we transform the W the V vector to W in a different coordinate system leaves the origin fixed because both coordinate systems have the same origin. So we just uh, 
rotate something around the origin. And sometimes we need a general transformation matrix where we also incorporate a vector d that represents the difference between the origins. So the global coordinate system could be at one place and the local coordinate system of an object could be at another place. And then we need a vector representing the difference in origins between the two coordinate systems. And then we just add a new vector d to the resulting transformation. There are two drawbacks with this equation. We need a multiplication operation followed by an addition of the d vector. Uh, so we need two operations and it would be beneficial if we only had to do one multiplication operation which probably is faster for us. And the vector v can represent both a point in space, so we have a single point, or a direction going from one point to another. And if v is a direction, we don't want to add v or offset d because a direction doesn't have any starting point because, because that would change the direction in which v points. And both of these drawbacks are solved if we use something called the four-dimensional homogeneous coordinate, which is the standard in most modern 3D systems. In this system, three-dimensional vectors have a fourth component labeled w. If a vector represents a direction, the w component is zero. If a vector e represents a point in space where we need to change the origins, the w component is one. So in the four-dimensional homogeneous coordinates used in 3D system, 3D worlds, the general transformation matrix looks like we have the same R, S, and T vectors representing the X, Y, and Z axis in the local coordinate space, and we add the translation vector D, which offsets the region between the global and local coordinate systems, and we have the fourth component, 0, 0, 0, 1, multiplied by the vector uh, with the fourth component, W. And if we calculate the resulting vector W from a direction vector where we, the W is 0, you will see that the offset ve vector D will be ignored. And if it's 1, the offset vector d will be used in the calculation. So then we only have to make one matrix multiplication and not a matrix multiplication followed by um, ad addition. And there are some common transformations that we will get in contact with when we work with game development. Translation is one which I've talked a bit about. A translation moves the origin of a coordinate system without reorienting or stretching the axis. So if we have a coordinate system, we simply move a coordinate system. So it's the analog of moving an object around in the game world relative to the origin of a game world. And the translation matrix looks like this. We have a diagonal matrix with ones in the main diagonal and zeros in the rest multiplied by the translation. The translation is the difference between the old and the new origin. We can also scale an object. We want to stretch an object with a factor alpha uh, a in the x-axis, b in the y-axis and c in the z-axis. And we can then use the following matrix in the transformation. So instead of ones in the main diagonal, we have the different factors we want to scale the object with a, b, and c in the main diagonal. And if a, b, and c is the same, it's called a uniform scale. Otherwise, it's a non-uniform scale. And if we have ones in the main diagonal, nothing will change. So the scale will be uh, the same. Rotations is something that is very common and a bit complex in, in games. So we're going to first look at rotation in 2D. We want to rotate an object. And suppose we have a point P here in, in uh, the bottom vector. And we want to rotate the point uh, a number of degrees delta degrees around the, or theta degrees around the origin. 
and the point P will now be in a new position called P prim. So we rotate around the region with some angle. And we can then calculate the new position P prim by using what is called a rotation matrix. So P prim, the new position after rotation is the same as having the rotation matrix cosinus of the angle minus sine angle sine angle and cosine sine of the angle multiplied by the point P and we get the new vector P prim. So this is what we call the rotation matrix in 2D worlds. And it occurs in the xy plane which is equivalent to a rotation about the z-axis in three dimensions. And rotations in three dimensions are usually done as three consecutive 2D rotations about each of the coordinate axes. So first we can rotate around the z-axis as here, then we can rotate, or rotate around the y and the x-axis. So we make three consecutive rotations. And since we use the four-dimensional homogeneous coordinate system, the rotation uses four x4 matrices. So these are the rotation matrices for rotations in 3D. So the first one, the z-rotate, you recognize is similar to the rotation in 2D, but we add two, one, two ones and a lot of zeros to make it a 4x4 matrix. And the y rotation looks like this and the x rotation looks like this. So we can rotate first around one axis, then around the next axis, and finally around the third axis by multiplying the different three-dimensional points with the different uh, rotation matrices. Geometry. In free to graphics, you can often talk about surfaces and planes, which is a flat surface. Uh, to describe the direction of a plane, we usually define a normal vector called n. So we have a normal vectors, which is very important in graphics. And a normal vector is, as I said before, a vector that is perpendicular 90 degrees to the plane. And the plane has two normal ve vectors as shown in the figure, one pointing up and one pointing down. It's usually the one pointing up that we are interested in. And if a plane has the normal vector n and passes through a point p, we can check if another point Q lies in the plane with the following equation, the dot product of n dot Q minus P. If it's equal zeros, Q lies in the plane, which can be important when we talk about collisions, etc. The normal vector is often normalized to unit length, and if it is in unit length, we can use the following important equation. D, a scalar, equals n dot q plus d, where d equals minus n dot p. And if d equals zero, the point q lies in the plane. If d is positive, the point q lies on the positive side of a plane, above the plane. If d is negative, the point lies on the negative side, below the plane. And this is very important in rendering because we want to see if a point is visible, visible by the camera or not, or if it's hidden by, obstructed by some other game object. For a general surface, the normal to a point on a surface is the same as the normal to the tangent plane to that surface at that point. And the tangent line at a given point at a 2D curve is a straight line that just touches the curve at that point. And mathematically, the tangent point C on a curve Fx is a straight line that passes through C and has a slope of F prime C, where F prime is the derivative of F. In three dimensions, the tangent is a plane instead of a straight line. So it looks like this. If we have two dimensions, a curve, the tangent line just touches the point on the curve. And in three dimensions, we have a plane that just touches the sphere or the other object at one point. And these are very important when we render objects.
and the normal to a round surface is the same as the normal to the tangent plane of that surface. So if we can find the tangent plane by taking the derivative of the curve, then we can find the normal to the tangent plane. And normal vectors are also very important in lighting and shading, where we're used to calculate the orientation of the surface towards the light source. So the light is shining on some surface, and we can calculate the normal vector and then we can calculate the outgoing reflected light to make lighting realistic in a 3D scene. In almost all 3D systems today, models are made up of triangles. So all objects we see rendered in a 3D scene are made up of triangles because triangles are the smallest bounding area object we have. A square needs four points, a triangle only needs three. And if we have less than three, if we have two points, we just have a single line. So it's the smallest geometrical figure with an area we have. And the more triangles we have, the more smooth the model will look like. Uh, so the math we have discussed today forms the basic of 3D graphics uh, by having all the diff using all the different f mathematical stuff we have learned today. We can, for example, calculate shading of a model by calculating the angle between the normal vector of each triangle in the model and the lighting source. And there is, of course, much more to learn. And if you are interested, there are many books about 3D graphics available. And there are also courses and books in linear algebra if you want to learn more about vectors and matrices and stuff. But let's look at an actual model from uh, a game called Evolve. And it looks like this. So the in-game character roughly have around 40,000 triangles. So there's a lot and lot of triangles making up this uh, space character, spacesuit character. The final thing we're going to talk about today are collision detection and response. And we briefly mentioned it in the previous lecture. We're going, lecture. we're going to talk a bit more about it today. So, collision detection and response is important. And we will go through it in more detail here because that's a fundamental thing in 3D worlds. So, if we have n game objects, each object must be tested if it collides with n minus one other game objects. Since it doesn't have to check if it collides with itself. So if we have, for example, 100 game objects in the world, in the naive, naive case, we need to do around 10,000 collision checks, almost at least. And that's a lot of collision checks to do. So we need some strategies for both reducing the number of collision checks required and the time needed for each collision check. So let's look at some common techniques for collision detection. The first one, and a very common simple one, is called overlap te testing. And the idea behind this is that at every simulation step, each pair of objects will be tested to determine if they overlap with each other. If they overlap, they are in collision. And this is also known as a discrete test, since only one point in time is being tested. So we step in the simulation and check if two objects collide. And the overlap test if any part of an object is inside any part of another object. And of course, if we have 40,000 triangles in both objects, there's a lot of calculations that we need to do. And that's a fast operation if we have very simple volumes like spheres and boxes, but quite complex if we have 40,000 triangles. So for polygonal objects, models made up of polygons, which almost always are triangles, the overlap test is significantly more difficult. It takes a lot of time. And usually a common but not perfect technique is to test if any of the vertices Q, a point where triangles meet, we have a a pyramid made up of a number of triangles and where two triangles meet, two or more 
we have what is called a vertex. So if any of the vertices Q of one object lies in the area of a plane on another object, we say that they are in collision. And then we can use the formula we just described before. We can test the, po the point Q, which is a vertex, and with this formula, where we need the normal vector. As mentioned before, approximating complex models by simpler geometrical shapes is often needed to speed up collision detection because collision detection takes a lot of time. And to determine the response where should the two colliding objects be placed after a collision, we can use a technique called bisection. If a collision occurs at the simulation time t1, we rewind the collision to the previous step time step T0, where no collision occurred. And now we move the simulation forward by half the previous step, so T0.5. If we have a collision, the simulation is rewinded, and we keep going back and forth and iterate until we reach the time right before the collision. So it looks like this. T1, we are in collision. T0, we are not in collision. T05, we are in collision. T0.25, we are not in collision. T0.375, we are just in collision. So the third, we need to iterate three times to see where the actual objects are placed at the time of impact. There are some limitations of overlap testing, and uh, the major one is that it can fail to detect collisions for small and fast-moving objects. So consider a bullet fired at a window, the figure below. At time t0, the bullet can be on the outside of the window, and at time t1, it can be on the inside. And since we only check for collisions at discrete steps, t0, t1, t2, we will never notice that the bullet would collide with the window so we don't detect the actual collision. So that's a major drawback of overlap testing. Uh, so to deal with this, we need another type of collision detection called intersection testing, and it predicts future, coll future collisions before they happen. And since they predict collisions, the simulation can be moved forward very slowly to the time of impact. So we don't just check at discrete time intervals, we check at very, very small time intervals. So we predict that a collision will happen in half a simulation step. We can temporarily slow down the simulation step to 0 0.5 because we know that we will have a collision in 0 0.5 time units and we can slow down the simulation so we know now we have a collision. And this is often more accurate and efficient than the forward and remind rewind steps used by overlap testing. And it works like this. In intersection testing tests the geometry of an object swept in the direction of travel against the swept geometry of other objects. And whatever geometry the object is composed of, it must be extruded over the distance of travel. So an example here is if we extrude a sphere over two simulation steps, T0 and T1, we create a tube. And if any other game object is in collision with a tube, we know that a collision will happen between the time steps 0 and 1. So if two extruded geometries overlap, we have a future collision. And if we have possible multiple collisions in the future, we need to move a simulation forward to solve one at a time. So we solve the first one, then the second one, etc. And the actual calculation for determining if a collision occurs and when it does is out of scope for this course. So we just need to know that intersection testing solves some problem and it's a quite good technique to use. There are, of course, some drawbacks even with this approach. Uh, two major limitations. Future predictions rely on knowing the exact state of the game world. And in online games, we might not know the exact state due to latency of networks, packets, etc. And intersection testing also assumes a constant velocity and no acceleration because it simulates 
what will happen in the future. It doesn't actually know what will happen in the future in the simulation steps. And this might, and it might not be the case for all game objects that they have constant velocity. We often also need to optimize the collision detection because it takes time. And, and two ways of doing that, and very common ways, are using simplified collision volumes, which we talked briefly about in the previous lecture, and also organize entities in, for example, Greece or BSP trees to reduce the number of entity pairs we need to calculate collisions for. So we reduce the number of collision checks and make each collision check faster. And we briefly mention both, but we will take a look at it in, in more detail. Simplified geometry means that a complex shape is approximated with a simple shape to reduce computation time needed for collision detection because some simple geometry are very, very fast to calculate collisions with. Uh, and we will use this in the Space Shooter project where the capsule collider approximates both the laser bolts and the asteroids. And most collision volumes are sometimes called bounding volumes. We can use spheres and capsules. They are very useful. Spheres are particularly good since we can do very quick collisions test by calculating if the distance between two spheres, spheres is less than the sum of their radius. So some bounding volumes here. We have a laser shot approximated by a capsule collider and the asteroid is also approximated by a capsule collider. So we have fast and quick collision detection. To speed up overlap and intersection testing, we can also use a very powerful geometric operation called the Minkowski sum. And the Minkowski sum is created by sweeping the region of the first object X over all points belonging to the other object Y. So the Minkowski sum of a circle and a square, we sweep the, square, the circle over the square and we get a resulting new geometry. And they assume, Minkowski sum assumes that both objects are convex, which we usually are. We can approximate them with some convex volume. It's possible to use non-convex objects, but it turns out that it takes exponential time instead of linear time to calculate the Minkowski sum. And that's a bad thing because we want to save time. That's the main thing here. So when doing an intersection test, the extruded object becomes a single line which is tested with a Minkowski volume, which is a very fast operation. So the standard intersection test, we extrude the sphere, but in the intersection test we only need to check if the single line between T0 and T1 intersects with the Minkowski volume of the object. And testing if a line intersects with a volume is a very fast operation. So it's usually better to spend some time calculating the Minkowski sums than doing intersection tests with two volumes. And we can also calculate Minkowski sums for 3D objects. So here we have a spoon and a star shape and the resulting Minkowski sum. The very common capsules, spheres, and boxes are convex shapes, so therefore Minkowski sums can serve as the main method for collision detection in, in the game engine. And it's also possible to use rough convex volumes to de determine if a collision might occur and then calculate con collisions in more detail, geometry, if a rough test detects a possible collision. So this can quickly rule out which objects that definitely not are in collision with each other. So if we use the box around the uh, space rocket here, we can make a rough test. If a box is in collision with some other object, then we can do a second test where we use the actual geometry of the space rocket. The second optimization is to partitioning space to rule out which object might collude with our objects 
we can partition entities using, for example, a simple grid. So we place objects in, in grids and we know that they will only have possible collisions with objects that are in the same grid or the neighboring grid that the object is moving towards. So we don't have to care about checking collisions with, with objects that are on the other side of, of the game world. There are some problems we need to deal with here, for example, if an entity is between two cells, but this is not the major is issue. The worst case is if all objects are in the same grid cell and then we will have to check collisions with all other objects. But on average we have reduced the number of collision checks to linear instead of exponential time complexity. So that's a very large gain. The final thing, collision resolution, when we have detected a collision or collision response, sometimes called determines what happens with two objects after we have detected a collision. And so far we have calculated where two objects are at the time of impact when they collide. But in some cases the collision will result in new velocity. For example, if two balls collide, they bounce on each other. And resolution procedure are divided into three parts, a prologue, the collision, and an epilogue. And we'll go through it in quite high level now, because there's a lot of quite complex calculation in, in this phase. So the prologue is called first, when we know that a collision has occurred, and it is responsible for checking if a collision resolution is needed or not, if we need to calculate new velocities. A resolution, resolution is not needed if, for example, a bullet hits a target because the bullet is destroyed and the target is damaged and possibly destroyed, but it will probably stay at the same place. But if we fire a bullet at a humanoid and the humanoid falls back or something, then we need to calculate the collision response. And the prologue can also trigger events such as playing sound effects or running animations or explosions or that the character says I'm hit and an animation for a character. In the collision step, both objects will be placed at the point of impact when we know where a collide and new velocities will be calculated. And they can be calculated using most commonly the physics engine or some other decision logic. And the collision step is a bit different on if we use overlap or intersection testing. In intersection testing, the objects never actually penetrate each other. In overlap testing, we iterate the forward and rewind steps until the exact time of impact is found. And the epilogue, the, the third step, takes care of any post effects of a collision, uh, which can sometimes be the same as the prologue. Playing sound effects and animations inflict damage, running scripts, uh, and what to place in the epilogue and what to place in the prologue is up to the game developer. Sometimes you might not need the epilogue at all. And to determine how moving objects behave in a world when they collide and other things is governed by the laws of physics. And some game worlds and most game worlds we work with simulate in more or less detail a real physical world. Uh, often we have to simplify things, otherwise it would take too long to calculate all the things we need to calculate. And physics is very, it's a very complex and large area and it will not be part of this course. There's a lot of books about physics engines which you can read if you're interested. But we rely on using one of all excellent physics engines available and Unity has a lot of uh, different, uh, very good physics engines with a lot of different features and functionality. When we work with Unity we will now come in contact with something called rigid body and rigid body dynamics, objects that move, rotate and can collide but are not deformed are referred to as rigid bodies. They can collide, but nothing happens to the actual object when we collide, except that it might 
be destroyed or something. And most of our game object we use are rigid bodies and, and that's all physics and you support them because that's the most common physical object. But there's also something called soft body dynamics. It's objects that are deformed based on applied forces and interaction with other objects. And one such example are balls, balls filled with liquid. So we have a ball uh, going down on the stairway and it's deformed on the stairway steps. And soft bodies is not very common. It's not supported by all physics engines because it takes a lot of time to calculate soft body dynamics and in real time games we don't have much time to do complex calculations. A more common type of soft bodies is clubbing and it's supported by many game engines uh, and it's used to create realistic characters, banners, flags, etc. And the triangular mesh for a cloth shall correctly follow the volume of the object it is covering. So the red clothing on the character here follows the body of the character. There's also something called fluid dynamics and some physics engines can simulate fluid dynamic, dynamics such as water or other liquids and that's quite complex of calculations and operations as well. And there's also something called ragdoll physics and in ragdoll physics a character is simulated by placing rigid body joints where natural skeleton joints are located. And the physics engine will take care of how the skeleton moves and behaves in the game world. So we will calculate how all joints behave when we move a character and it's an alternative to pre-made animations. So to summarize, vectors and matrices are essential numerical quantities for our game development and we will use both a lot of times, especially vectors. And it's important that we know what they are and how they are used in games and some common operations like multiplications, dot products and cross products. Collision detection is an important and expensive task and we can optimize it by using simplified collision volumes and partitioning game entities in, for example, a grid. Collision detection and response can be done with both overlap and intersection testing. Both have their pros and cons and which one to use is up to the game developers. So that's all for this lecture. The third lecture in uh, the course 1DV437, Introduction to Game Programming. My name is Johan Hagelbeck. Thanks for listening.